Today, we generate about two and a half quintillion bytes of data every single day. That's 2.5 billion billion bytes of data every single day. Every single day. Right? If you're still struggling with that number, think of it this way. It's about 625 billion Harry Potter books being written every single day. Our focus in the cognitive computing space is on amplifying human cognition. This isn't about replacing the human mind. This is about how we make human beings more intelligent. In this last year, we've been focused more on the human personal aspects of interaction, what we call the human-machine interface, based on understanding the person. Not just what they asked, but what was their, their intention at the time they were asking it. But what we're able to do is by taking a set of texts that somebody authored, and it could be their tweets, it could be emails, it could be an article, whatever it is, but as long as they wrote it, we can look at that article, and by looking at how they wrote what they put down on paper, we can determine a lot about their personality. There's been a lot of buzz around this thing called deep learning. The fact is that our technology is evolving rapidly. The technologies that we use to begin with around machine learning and what we call handcrafted feature engineering has now been replaced with deep learning techniques. And all these elements of sort of body language and vocalization represent aspects of increasing fidelity in that relationship between the human and the machine in the form of this embodied cognition. Cognitive computing is going to be to the computer science world um, that transactional processing is today. Because as ultimately, that's how you affect human cognition, is to kind of understand the human psychology and how to insert information at just the right time in that process of discovery that activates our creative process, our creative spirit. Now we can potentially introduce computers into the decision-making process on such a micro scale that it will affect not only all the decisions we make every day, but how we apply those decisions to doing things of interest and of value. And in the process of learning, there is no end state for the educational process. There is no, I now know that I'm done. There's right. no way to mathematically prove its correctness. You have to recognize whether they're performing based on how well their behavior is providing utility to your current situation. And that's going to evolve and vary as it, gets exposed, as it gets exposed to new experiences in your context, mm -hmm. right? Gets to know you better. It seeks its ecosystem your... and tries to find the meaningful patterns and optimize against that, and that's gonna be true in every startup. That's right, that's right. Because we're always learning. We're constantly learning. We can actually argue that everything that we do is a learning experience, and therefore, even though we may, though we may not be in the education, uh, in the classroom of some university, we're in the classroom of life, and you know, the role that these cognitive systems can have in helping us go through that educational process, even as the cognitive system itself is going through that educational process, can in fact be tied very closely together. You're able to address what today is a major gap mm -hmm. in the practice and the art of medicine. It actually, in some sense, allows the doctor to get back to the art of medicine, you know, being with their patient, spending less time doing all the research, having the system do the research for them so they can make better decisions. At the end of the day, these things are all about making people do what they do better. Right? They're all about allowing us to come up with the ideas that we couldn't come up with, or in the case of doctors, coming up with treatment options they wouldn't have otherwise considered, not because they're not bright, intelligent people, they just don't have the time. Not only, you know, not only do the engineers and the scientists who are creating the technology have to be thoughtful and responsible about what they're doing, but in fact, I think we have an obligation as a society to understand the impact that these technologies can have and to pay, place expectations on the companies and the scientists and the engineers that are creating this stuff to create things that are useful, create things that are going to be constructive in our society. Well, first of all, I think that it's actually very healthy to have competition out there. Uh, I can tell you, every, every project I've ever worked on in my career, we got a lot better ourselves when there was competition out there. So, you know, market forces do work. IBM is not the same now as it was 100 years ago. It wasn't the same as, it's not the same now. Why do you like as, your hand? Well, because, you know, first of all, as a company, I think what we've been very successful at is adapting to change. And we are going through change today in our industry. Uh, the transformation from program-based development to um, cognitive development is a fundamental shift in our industry. And uh, we've demonstrated, uh, I think, a very healthy way of, um, of adapting to that and driving that. Mm -hmm.